Across the Christian world today is known as Trinity Sunday, when we celebrate God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit as beautifully expansive expressions of the divine. As you listen to this excerpt from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, listen for these different parts of God and how Paul talks about them and what kind of relationship they have with one another and with us. A reading from the book of Romans. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions, knowing that affliction produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. It is truly a gift to be back among you, beloved church. I grew up here. I was confirmed by the Reverend Bob Stout in 2003, where Nancy Jangi was one of our fearless teachers. I taught toddler Sunday school just down the hall. I ran through this building playing sardines. I watched Jesus Christ Vampire Hunter at one of Seth's first youth group meetings with us. <laughs> I interned here twice, once in 2011, once in 2013, and you all ordained me here in 2014. I share all of this to say thank you. Thank you to Seth for the invitation. Thank you to all of you for the warm welcome. Thank you for being a very important part of the village that raised me. Thank you for shaping the minister and parent and person I am today. Welcome home. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Growing up just a few blocks away here in Glen Ellen, one of the values that was instilled in me was independence. I was allowed to walk down to Schmidt's Pharmacy or the candy store with my allowance burning a hole in my pocket. I learned to navigate the complicated metro schedule well enough to get me and my friends downtown Chicago to the beach or to a concert. My sister and I would bike to the library or to Sunset Pool all summer long. As a student at Glumbard West, I would take off to who knows where during opus, open campus lunch. Do they still have open campus lunch at Glumbard West? Yeah, that's like a little terrifying to me as a parent now. Um, <laughs> I was really proud of being able to navigate the world on my own. And when I headed off to college, it's what my new friends noticed most about me. I was fearless about doing things on my own, navigating new situations, making decisions independently. It was a point of pride for me. Like, here I am, I'm still a teenager, I can handle myself in the world, no problem. And isn't that what every parent or teacher or mentor wants? To shape kids into self-sufficient, independent, confident people? This week, my daughter Phoebe, age three and a half, and I noticed another three and a half year old was up here. The, the half is really important. Um, she mastered putting on her shirt without getting her head stuck. And my son Ori, who turns one next week, is working on pulling up to stand. These little milestones are meaningful in large part because they mark what a child is able to do on their own, how they are developing skills to be able to navigate the world independently, without help. Independence is a value that has transcended time and place, and it's a survival skill, too. It's not a bad thing to develop the skills you need to navigate the world successfully, but when we bend too far in the direction of independence and into the realm of individualism, it gets really lonely. If we're always trying to do things on our own, we end up alone. We start to believe we have to do things by ourselves, that we don't need anyone else. And it's incredibly isolating to move through the world this way. 
We can start to believe that everything we have and everything we've done is our own doing, forgetting all about our village and about God. For those of us who value independence, the pandemic has been a rude awakening. There's the practical side of things, like it's really tough to quarantine when you don't have someone to bring you food or a family member to watch your kids or a community to keep you going when you're feeling down. But there's also this bigger, more systemic piece about how we are all interconnected. We all rely on one another. We stayed home back in the spring of 2020 to reduce strain on hospitals because what I choose to do affects your ability to get a hospital bed when you need it. The odd grocery shortages. Our family particularly relies on products that use sunflower seeds and oil, and that's been deeply impacted by supply chain issues. All of it, it makes you realize that the eight billion of us across the world are inexplicably intertwined with one another. Emily St. John Mandel's pandemic novel, Station Eleven, was a favorite of mine when it came out in 2014, and its newfound popularity and transformation into an HBO series is no surprise, given the events of the last few years. In the book, A Deadly Virus, the Georgia flu tears across the globe and wipes out 98% of the world's population. At this scale, the transformation of the world is much starker and more immediate than what we've experienced with COVID-19, but it feels like it exists on the same axis of disruption. An early character in the book, Jeevan, observes in the first days of this fictional pandemic, quote, Jeevan found himself thinking about how human the city is, how human everything is. We bemoaned the impersonality of the modern world. But that was a lie, it seemed to him. It had never been impersonal at all. There had always been a massive, delicate infrastructure of people, all of them working unnoticed around us. And when people stop going to work, the entire operation grinds to a halt. No one delivers fuel to the gas stations or the airports. Cars are stranded, airplanes cannot fly, trucks remain at their points of origin. Food never reaches the cities, grocery stores close, businesses are locked and then looted. No one comes to work at the power plants or the substations. No one removes fallen trees from electrical lines. Jeevan was standing by the window when the lights went out. End quote. Not impersonal at all, right? Our world is a pulsing network of human connection, and we are not just interconnected, we are interdependent. We rely on one another. Returning to that letter Paul wrote to the Romans, it's clear that the early church understood the call to Christianity as a call to interdependence. In this society that valued independence as much as we do now, Paul reminds the Romans that our hope is derived not through our allegiance to capitalism or to what we can accomplish, but through the grace in which we stand. And that grace comes from the peace of Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the abundance and power of the Holy Spirit. This paradox of three d distinct and diverse beings in one God serves as a model for our own relationships with one another. The church in Rome was both one that was distinct and isolated from the relationships of mainstream Roman society and one that was profoundly relational. It was distinct in the Roman Empire in its mission to care for one another, to look out for the most vulnerable, and to push back against the injustices of the empire. The Roman Church, too, was shaped by the diversity of its population, Jews and Gentiles, people speaking dozens of different languages with an incredible range of cultural practices. 
The union of the Trinity, as Paul explained it, was to show this ragtag group how they could be united in God's love as well. The only way for them to find hope in the midst of their disagreements and struggles and suffering, Paul writes, is for them to show up for one another, to show up for God, and to know and trust that God is showing up for them as well. As I was gearing up to come back here, I was remembering my very first work camp experience, Portland, Oregon, 2005. That first work camp was a a parent-encouraged experience. Uh, And I I didn't know many people well at all. I was so, so nervous, and so I thought maybe I would just keep to myself. And instead, I found myself on a work site with three older youth who immediately taught me the games to play to make the time pass more quickly, and who taught me that we honor the folks we serve and one another by working really hard and doing the best job we can. I found myself receiving lemonade from an elderly woman who couldn't afford the painting and gardening work we were doing, but who was gracious enough to let a crew of teenagers make our earnest attempt. I found myself with Liz Mook in a bathroom in a YMCA, dyeing our hair purple just for the fun of it, because we could. I found myself sitting in a dark church basement in a circle of my peers, listening to reflections on the day. I'm thinking, wow, these are my people. I have people. It took me a while to put God language to it, but I now know I was living the expression, we belong to one another because we belong to God. Pride Month is about drawing that we as wide as possible, both inside the church community and far beyond it. You are hearing sermons about LGBTQ plus inclusion this month from folks much more qualified than me to speak to the theological nuances. For me, a straight, white, cisgender pastor, one theological truth that grounds me in the call to the widest possible welcome is in that trinity, in the simultaneous diversity and unity of God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The interdependence and relationality of the Trinity tells me that that is what God intends for us to, interdependence and relationality. Now, interdependence is a vulnerable thing. It requires us to rethink the ways we understand our own identities as independent and self-sufficient people. But it is only when we acknowledge that we have our own stories, our own pain, and our own need for transformation that we can truly enter into that deep kind of relationship. My most recent ministry role was as a clergy organizer for an interfaith, nonpartisan, political power building organization across the state of Minnesota. This interdependence was at the core of our work. In our theory of change, we believe that we often use interdependence or self-sufficiency to put forth a facade of, of being okay, no matter what might be simmering under the surface, no matter what kind of, of pain or struggles we might be hiding. But what happens when we all mask our pain? Well, what happens is that we can't come together to make our community more inclusive of LGBTQ plus people or inclusive in any other kind of way. We can't change policy. We can't make a difference until we each understand that our own liberation is tied up in the liberation of our neighbor. None of us is free until all of us are free. My current ministry gig, as I am calling it, is as a full-time mom. I'm three weeks in. God bless all of you who have done this for years. There is nothing like wrangling an infant and a preschooler to get a person clear that they can't do it alone. 
The cliche that it takes a village to raise a child is a cliche for a reason. It's impossible even for two parents who are super involved, super attentive, engaged, and both at home uh, to raise kids alone. When I was still working outside the home, our childcare providers were a really important part of our village. And now I'm grateful for a network of local stay-at-home moms who are always up for a playground hangout or an emergency uh, take one kid so I can bring the other one to an appointment. My parents, Nancy and Jim Ellis, who many of you know well, moved up to the Twin Cities and they're an incredible support to us. And the church we recently joined is becoming a part of our village too. It's not just that my husband Greg and I can't physically do all that our kids need to thrive. Um, that is certainly true, but it's also that our kids and we gain perspective and understanding and social skills and trust from these mutually supportive relationships. To you all, the community who taught me the value of interdependence and the truth of an expansively loving and welcoming God. Thank you for being part of the village that raised me. And thank you for doing that sacred work for generation after generation. Paul writes, hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. I have hope because of communities like this one. Vessels for God's love in a world that so desperately needs it. Thanks be to God. Amen.